Ruth chapter 4 is where we are this morning, and uh, we will be picking up in verses 13 all the way through the end of the chapter, all the way to verse 22. So Ruth chapter 4, beginning in verse 13 all the way down to verse 22. Hear now the word of the Lord. So Boaz took Ruth, and she became his wife. And he went into her, and the Lord gave her conception, and she bore a son. Then the women said to Naomi, Blessed be the Lord, who has not left you this day without a Redeemer. May his name be renowned in all of Israel. He shall be to you a restorer of life, and a nourisher in your old age. For your daughter-in-law, who loves you, who is more to you than seven sons, has given birth to him. And then Naomi took the child and laid him on her lap. And became his nurse And the women of the neighborhood gave him a name Saying a son has been born to Naomi And they named him Obed He was the father of Jesse The father of David Now these are the generations of Perez Perez fathered Hezron Hezron fathered Ram Ram fathered Aminadab Aminadab fathered Nashon Nashon fathered Salmon Salmon fathered Boaz Boaz fathered Obed Obed fathered Jesse and Jesse fathered David. This is God's word. All God's people said? Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Well, this morning we are wrapping up our six-week series in the book of Ruth. And uh, there are a few different avenues that we can take as we look at these last uh, verses from verses 13 to 22. And uh, as we conclude our series, there's kind of three different ways or three different avenues we could take. Uh, so what I want to do is uh, I want to just briefly mention those three and then we're going to have to pick one because each one of these three would merit a sermon in of itself and I only have uh, 25 minutes. And so what we're going to do is we're going to just pick one, but I am going to weave throughout uh, the, the sermon this morning kind of all three. So uh, here are kind of the, the three avenues, if you will, that we could take. First is that redemption has a scandalous past and we'll, we'll look at the genealogy of this son that is born to Boaz and to Ruth named Obed. And second is that religion needs redemption. And third is that redemption has expectations. And like I said, I'm going to weave bits and pieces of all three into my message. But again, I want to encourage you this week uh, to explore uh, and uh, kind of take one of these themes and, and see for yourself. Explore for yourself chapter four um, this, excuse me, this week. But the entire book of Ruth is about one thing. The entire book of Ruth is about redemption. All three previous chapters uh, culminate to this final chapter. The entire chapter four is about one thing and one thing alone, and that is redemption. Uh, and so here's what I want to do for the next couple minutes. Uh, there's uh, some of you who have not been here for the past six weeks. Uh, maybe some of you were here, but were sleeping through the past three weeks. I don't blame you. I'm here with you. Uh, but what I want to do is just quickly recap where we've been, some lessons that we've learned, some practical applications from each one of those chapters, and then we'll land on verses 13 through 22 and look at, at this beautiful picture of redemption as laid out, believe it or not, through a family tree, through a genealogy, okay? So that's what we're going to do this morning. So chapter 1 is going to be kind of like drinking from a fire hydrant, okay? So just buckle up. Here we go. So chapter 1, we saw this. We saw God's hand or God's presence in our suffering, okay? And, and we, we pick up the story, and there's a funeral, essentially. The, the beginning of the book of Ruth begins with this tragedy where there's a man named Elimelech. His name means God is my king. And there's this land, there's this famine in the land, the land of Israel, specifically in the town or the city of Bethlehem. There is no bread in Bethlehem, which, ironically enough, Bethlehem means house of bread. So you have Elimelech, God is my king, marries Naomi, her name means pleasant, this is going to be important just, uh, as, we, as we go through the story, and they have two sons, Kilian and Malon. Kilian means weakling, Kalon means kind of sickly, okay? So these, here's this family, they're in the city of Bethlehem, there is no bread in the house of bread, and Elimelech makes a tragic decision. Uh, instead of uh, either looking for another place in Israel to move his family. He goes 50 miles east 
to Moab. If you know your story uh, in Genesis, Moab was not a place you'd want to take your family. Moab was a group of people that were started from uh, a sexual sin of incest between a father, Lot, and his daughter. And the children that came out of that, that uh, sinful union was the people of Moab. And they prided themselves in having their origin in, uh, in incest and also were just very wicked, dark, depraved group of people. So what Elimelech does is he moves his family to Moab. After a few years, Elimelech dies, and he really leaves his wife and his sons no choice but to really stay there. His sons grow up, and they marry two Moabite women. Again, not a great place to kind of leave your family. One of the women, one of the Moabite women was named Orpah. The other was named Ruth. And then Kilion and Malon both die. And that's where chapter 1 almost ends. Because there's this tragedy where Ruth is a widow. Naomi, who actually the whole book of Ruth is about Naomi, is also a widow and is also sonless. She's destitute. And all seems lost. And then we get the first inkling of God's hand of provision. Naomi heard that God had visited his people. There was some bread. There was Food, there was rain in Bethlehem. So we saw God's hand in our suffering. Naomi goes back to Bethlehem. She walks into Bethlehem. All the women kind of whisper, saying, Is that Naomi? We don't even recognize her. And who's that Moabitess woman with her? Scandalous. She's not welcome here. She's going to ruin this place. That's chapter one. And Naomi says, Don't call me Naomi. My name is Mara now. Call me Mara, which means bitter. Because God has been bitter towards me. And we saw that the pain of God's pruning work is never needlessly harsh. It's always meant to accomplish the task of returning us back to Him. And it, it, chapter 1 ends with this, that, that God had visited His people and that God's favor was falling back on the people of Israel. And that was chapter 1. Chapter 2, we see God's hand in our choices— that God's hand, His presence is in our choices. And we, we saw how one morning Ruth wakes up, and again, there's no food, there's nothing for them to, to work and to be able to make a living. And so Ruth said, hey, I heard that if I go out in the fields and I glean, which was kind of a modern day of the soup kitchen or picking up aluminum cans to recycle to maybe buy a sandwich that they could split between the two of them, if I do that, maybe we can eke out some existence. So I'm going to go out there and do this. I'm going to go glean in the fields, which is very dangerous for a single woman. That's where you would be assaulted. It was extremely dangerous for someone to do that. Naomi says, go, and I hope you find a good field. And we have this theme of it just so happened that Ruth happens upon the field of Boaz. And this just so happened, again, is this nod, nod, wink, wink. It's not just it just so happened. This is actually God's providential hand in our lives. And we, we saw how God is in the ordinary. That, that God it meets us in our ordinary. And not only does God meet us in our ordinary, but God uses the ordinary in extraordinary ways. God is not a distant God in your life that watches from afar, sets things in motion, and watches from afar. No, God is in the details of your life. That your everyday choices are overseen by a sovereign God. And those choices, God has a direct hand of providence in. So, yes, pray, seek counsel, and then do what seems to be the best. Go do what seems to be the logical option. Trust God's providence in the everyday affairs of your life. That God is with us in the ordinary. And then we looked at chapter 3. God's hand in our risks. And we saw again uh, God's hand in providing a, a husband for this more by widow for Ruth. Chapter 3 begins with Naomi saying, You know what, Ruth? You uh, went to the fields, and Boaz was a really nice guy. He not only fed you, he gave you a seasonal job. For the past six to eight weeks, you had a job. You got to go to work. He paid you a good salary. In fact, he gave you a bonus. We've got some extra grain in the pantry. Um, I think this guy likes you, but he hasn't called, hasn't sent flowers, didn't send a messenger, did nothing. But I think I, I have a plan, Naomi tells Ruth. Here's what you're going to do, Ruth. You're going to go take a shower. 
go, go bathe. He's only seen you all sweaty and dirty while you're working in the field. So clean yourself up, okay? Go do your nails. Put on some makeup, all right? Also, take off uh, this, these, these, widow gown, uh, uh, these widow clothes, these, these gowns of mourning, which was very common at the time. Ruth probably every single day was working in these clothes that, that showed or was telling other people that she was in mourning. She was mourning the loss of her husband. She was a widow. And most likely, Boaz, well, he's a stand-up guy. He would not take advantage of someone who was mourning the loss of their husband. So here's what, what Naomi says. Go to the, uh, the company picnic. Go to the company party. Get yourself dolled up, okay? Um, guys can be kind of clueless, so uh, just kind of get in his way. Maybe he'll notice you, basically. And then she says, tells him to do something risky and, well, perhaps also risque, okay? She says, at the threshing floor, after he's eaten, after he's uh, had a great time with his buddies, after everything is kind of, the night went, um, kind of winds down, he's going to go fall asleep in front of this heap of, of grain because that's what they would do to ensure that no one would steal their crop. At midnight, Boaz wakes up and he sees that Ruth is not only at his feet, but he has, she has lifted up and uncovered his ankles. Ooh. And really what was going on there was Ruth was, doing, was taking a massive risk. Ruth was essentially proposing to, to Boaz to propose to her, but Boaz could have interpreted this in one of three ways. Right? The first way he could have interpreted it is what would happen all over Israel during the time of the judges. The threshing floor was where people got paid, and when people got paid and they drank too much and they ate too much and they partied too much, that's when they became loose and they started making a lot of sexual uh, sins. They started disobeying God's law. So Boaz could have probably woken up and looked at her and said, ah, I knew it. I had my hopes up about this girl, but she's a Moabite. She'll never be anything more than a Moabite. He could have just cast her away. He could have just said, go back. Or he could have fallen into the, the temptation, risking any chance of marriage. Or, as we saw, what does Boaz do? He, he says, who are you? And she says, I am Ruth, your servant. What, will you spread your wings over me? Meaning, will you care for me? Will you take care of me? And in chapter 3, we saw God's hand in our wrists. That, that there was... The time had come where there was nothing else they could do except for Ruth to say, I'm going to take a risk. And, and I hope that God will bless this risk I take. There's, there's times we must take these prayer-filled risks to see the providence of God in our hand. And we finished chapter 3 and looked into chapter 4 last week, and we saw that God's hand is also in our redemption. Boaz says, you are a worthy woman, Ruth. You did not take advantage of me. Ruth, you did not try to seduce me. I want to marry you. I love you. But... Per the Jewish custom, there's a, another relative who should be taking care of you, who has first dibs on not just the property rights, the land rights that are associated to this marriage, but also to you as a wife. He's kind of takes first dibs, but I, I'm going to do whatever I can to kind of make sure that I marry you. That was chapter 4, the first, the first part. We see that Boaz steps in. And he orchestrates this, this deal with this kinsman redeemer, this near relative. And he says, hey, I know you want the land that belongs to Naomi. Um, do you want it? He said, yes, I do. He said, all right, you can go ahead and buy it because if you don't buy it, I will. And just before uh, this other guy who, ironically enough and funny enough, in the Hebrew, he doesn't have a name, okay? Uh, what he's actually called is this this. This name where, where he's called, really in Hebrew, it's, it's what's-his-face. That's actually what it says. It's Mr. So-and-so or Mr. What's-his-face. He says, hey, before you, you buy the land, before we kind of do this transaction of I take off my sandal, you take off your sandal, we exchange sandals. Before we do that, oh, here, let me read to you the fine print. Uh, let me read to you the, the footnote. You can get the land, but you have to also get the Moabitess. You also get Ruth. The man's like, no way. No, I will not put in jeopardy, like, my inheritance. And there's no way that I will attach myself or allow this woman to attach herself to me and to my name. And Boaz says, awesome. I'm going to marry her. So that's where we left off last week. That's where we saw, we saw God's hand in our redemption, that the, the true story of 
Boaz and Ruth is the foreshadowing of a greater true story of redemption. That's, that's where we left off yesterday, uh, not yesterday, last week, feels like yesterday. But this morning, as we look and as we close out chapter 13, I'm sorry, wow, uh, chapter 4, verses 13 through verse 22, I want to draw our attention to something that, that will add to what we discussed last week. I want us to look at, at yes, God's hand of redemption, but, but how God does that redemption. Also, how God redeems not just our broken past, but the generational broken past that exists in our lives. And so we saw even last week that Boaz is this foreshadowing of Jesus. That, that Boaz is this foreshadowing of, of what Jesus would do to redeem us and that Ruth, in many ways, is this foreshadowing of the church. Now, the story of Ruth, like I said, begins with a funeral, and it ends with a wedding. Starts with a funeral, ends with a wedding. And so in verse 13, it says that Boaz took Ruth, she became his wife. The Lord gave her conception, and she bore a son. How long had Ruth been without a child? Probably 10 or so years. How long had, had Boaz been waiting to get married? Realistically, he was probably in his probably early 40s or 50s, right? And so there's this beautiful picture of, of this woman that, that God had his hand of provision because he had a plan, not just for Ruth, but from this union, from this family, the Savior of the world, the Messiah, would come. And there's this, this thematic, these thematic bookends in, in the book of Ruth. Chapter 1, God withholds the rain. In chapter 4, God gives us abundance of harvest. Chapter 1, God closes the womb of Ruth. Chapter 4, God opens the womb of Ruth and gives her a son. Chapter 1, Naomi is empty and she's bitter. In chapter 4, Naomi is full, blessed, and restored. And again, we can, we can see the hand of providence all throughout this story. The house that was filled with sorrow and lament and tears is now filled with the joyous laughter of an infant, of Naomi saying, I was empty, but now I'm full, of Ruth having that rest that Boaz had prayed over, saying, I pray that God will give you a home and a husband. All of that has been fulfilled. But the story of Ruth ends on a surprising note. It ends with a family tree. It ends not only pointing back, but also pointing forward, the story of Ruth ends with a legacy. And so what I want to do is I want to read for us real quick. So just that, that's why I have it up here. We're not going to go verse by verse, but I want to read for you guys the genealogy that was recorded in Matthew chapter 1. Yes, I'm going to read the Hebrew phone book, okay? But just bear with me, all right? Because there's a theme here. There's a pattern. So follow along as I read. Uh, beginning in Hebrew, I mean, beginning in Matthew chapter 1. The book of the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Abraham was the father of Isaac. Isaac was the father of Jacob. Jacob was the father of Judah and his brothers. Judah was the father of Perez and, and Zara by Tamar. Remember Tamar? That's scandalous. Genesis chapter 38. Read it later. Just not a great bedtime story for the kids though, okay? Perez, the father of Hezron. Hezron, the father of Ram. Ram, the father of Aminadab. Aminadab, the father of Nashon. Nashon, the father of Salmon. Salmon, the father of Boaz. By Rahab. Did you know Boaz's mother was Rahab? Wow. Boaz, the father of Obed. By Ruth. There she is again. Obed, by the father of Jesse. Jesse by the father of David, the king. David was the father of Solomon by the, uh, Solomon by the wife of Uriah. Doesn't even mention her name. Why? Because David murdered a man because he slept with Bathsheba. And Solomon, the father of Rehoboam, Rehoboam, the father of uh, Abijah, Abijah, the father of Asaph, Asaph, the father of Jehoshaphat, Jehoshaphat, the father of Wow, Joram, right? Joram, the father of Uzziah, and, As uh, and Asaph, the father of Jehoshaphat, Jehoshaphat, the father of Joram, and Joram, the father of Uzziah, Uzziah, the father of Jotham, Jotham, the father of Ahaz, Ahaz, the father of Hezekiah, Hezekiah, the father of Manasseh, Manasseh, the father of Amos, Amos, the father of Josiah, 
Josiah of Jeconiah, really bad guy, and his brothers at the time of the deportation to Babylon. After the deportation to Babylon, you have Jeconiah, the father of uh, Sheatiel, and Sheatiel, the father of Zerubbabel. Zerubbabel, the father of uh, Abud. Abud, the father of Elakim. Elakim, the father of Azar. Azar, the father of Zaduk. Zaduk, the father of Akim. Akim, the father of Eliud. Eliud, the father of Eleazar. Eleazar, the father of Matin. Matin, the father of Jacob. Jacob, the father of Joseph, the, the husband of Mary, of whom Jesus was born, who is called Christ. Why did I read all that? Because I highlighted some of the names, but those aren't even the scandalous ones. Because you have Abraham, who was a Babylonian, who not only had worshipped Babylonian gods in Ur, but leaves his wife aside and says, I'm going to sleep with a servant so that I can actually, thinking I can obey God. You have David, King David. You have, in this family tree is filled with broken people. The heroes are broken, let alone the villains. And, and here's what this says. The point is this, that in the family line of Jesus, there are prostitutes and liars and adulterers and murderers. So come on in. There's room for you too, okay? There's, there's nothing here that is beyond the scope and the power of Christ's redemption. And that's the whole point of Ruth. That's the whole point of, of even the author writing and saying, you want to know the storyline of the king of Israel? It comes through Tamar. It comes through um, uh, it comes through Rahab It comes through Ruth It comes through David It comes through all these people And what does this mean? That God is able to not only save But that God loves and works through Those of us who do very sinful things Because God is that good And God is that big And, and this is the point of the whole story here That God inserts Ruth Along with all these other people to show us that there's this very important distinction between religion and redemption. That it doesn't matter like where you've come from or, or where you are currently, that God is able to not only save you, but God is also going to use you. The point of Ruth is that redemption. And so there, there's this, this constant odds between religion, what I can do for God, versus redemption, what God does for me. In the last two minutes, I want to just clarify this. Religion says this, that if I obey God, God will love me. Redemption says the opposite, that because God loves me, I want to obey him. It's the equivalent of me telling my six-year-old, my eight-year-old, and my ten-year-old, hey, Mariah, Zeke, and Eden, daddy will love you if you obey me. But if you don't obey me, I'm not going to love you anymore. Like, like how twisted is that? Right? The point of redemption, the point of adoption, the point of salvation is because God loves me, I want to obey Him. As Paul says in Romans, that, that the kindness of God will, will draw me to, to repentance. God's grace in my life urges me to obey Him, to love Him, to follow Him. Religion says there are good people and bad people. Redemption says, no, we're all sinful people. Uh, there, there are sinful people who repent And there are sinful people who don't repent uh, the, the, the dichotomy between good people and bad people Religion loves that because who's the good people? Well, everyone else Like me, uh, the good people is me and everyone else like me Anyone who's not like me, those are the bad people Redemption says no All have sinned All have fallen short of the glory of God All are welcomed to repentance and to wholeness that's what the book of Ruth is about. But again, the story of Ruth is just it's a small illustration of a greater story of redemption. Last but not least, religion says your birth pedigree matters. Redemption says being born again is what matters. Religion says, hey, where did you go to school? Did you grow up in church? Are your parents Christians? Did you go to Wana? Did you read, do you read the KJV? Like, every, like what, did you miss Sunday school? What have you done? Like, are you born in the right family? Are you doing the right things? Now, don't get me wrong. Being born in a Christian family is a blessing. Knowing God's word is a blessing. But the trusting and relying on those things, all that does is it, it makes you cut in line on the pathway to hell. You trusting in what you can do for God is not redemption. 
You trusting what you can provide for God is not redemption. And so that's the beauty of the story of Ruth. That, that whatever you have done, whatever you're doing, there is room for you in the family of God. And that's the beauty also uh, of Ruth, is that she did not come from a great family. She did not come from this, this great religious pedigree. And, and what, what's, what's so beautiful about this whole story of Ruth is the fact that not only is this, again, a picture of the gospel, but it reminds us over and over and over again that we, like, that's not any different than us. That, that we like to hide. We like to hide and, and try to clean our lives up and then present it to God. And Jesus, being our better and greater Boaz, says, come. Don't try to clean yourself up. Come as you are. Trust me. I will give you this. I will come, and I will save you. I will rescue you. So Ruth opens with the funeral, ends with the wedding, and so does the gospel. Jesus dies, and then he rises again, and one day soon, sooner today than then yesterday, he's coming again. The whole point of Ruth also is to point you to your need of a Savior. And so this morning, we will sing and we'll celebrate our Savior. We will sing and celebrate what he's done for us. But even more so, this morning is an invitation that you would come. That you would not put your trust in religion. That you would not put your trust in what you can do for God. But rather, that you would come empty-handed and saying, God, I have nothing Will you, will you spread your wings over me? Will you care for me? And, and that is the whole point of the book of Ruth. It starts with this funeral. It, it, it calls us, it draws us in to remind us of God's providence over our lives. And some of you this morning might be Naomi and Ruth in chapter 1. You might be bitter towards God. You might be resentful. You might be in a dark place. And, and, and the Boaz, the greater Boaz, is calling out to you saying, Come and be filled. Come and have life. And that might be you today. Some of you might be Ruth in chapter 3. I'm taking a risk. God, if you don't have me, I don't know what else I can do. Will you take me as I am? And the answer is always yes. Some of you might be Ruth or Naomi in chapter 4. Where, where by God's grace, your, your, your life is full. By God's grace, things are going well. Praise God for that, but do not forget that the same grace that you've received, God extends to other people. Do not think that is because of how good, important, something that you've done, that you are where you are today. The gospel is for everyone, and the invitation is to come. Will you pray with me? Heavenly Father, thank you so much again for your word. Thank you for the book of Ruth, a true story reminding us of the glorious and greater true story, and that is the story of redemption through Christ. Father, there's so much here and so little time to unpack it, but yet we trust that your word is sufficient. I pray, Lord, that if there's any here this morning who do not know you, who are still trying to work out their salvation as if they can do it, as if they can impress you, that they would come broken as they are. There is room in the family for them. We thank you that your invitation is that we come to you and that by your power, you allow us to come to you. We ask, Lord, again, that you remind us of our need for you each and every day, that the gospel would not be an old-time story that was once true and we look back on, but that every single day we'd wake up and remember we need it for today. That I need you, oh, I need you, every hour we need you. We ask all these things in your name. Amen. Yeah.